Let's start with uh, our colloquia today. Welcome everybody. Today uh, we will have the, the talk by Dr. Mara Salvato from Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Garching, Germany. And uh, she will talk about arctic galactic nuclei as seen from uh, seven X-ray eyes of E. Rosita. Uh, I will uh, make a short uh, introduction to Dr. Mara Salvato. She got her degree in astronomy at the University of uh, Padova in Italy. Then in 2002, she defended he, her PhD in astrophysics at the University of Potsdam in Germany. Then that was devoted to the study of Seyfert One host galaxy and their environment in the context of Rosat Bright Survey under the supervision of Gunther Hassinger. Lately, she performed a long-term postdoc at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in the California Institute of Technology and then at the Max Planck Institute of Plasma. She is a staff scientist at the MPE since 2012. She's interested in AGN and galaxy evolution, physical properties of AGN host galaxies, AGN surveys, multi-wavelength extragalactic surveys, photometric redshifts, SID fitting and applications of machine learning techniques to large astronomical sets. Also, she's author of more than 350 refereed papers with more than three, uh, 37,000 citation with an age parameter of 101. In fact, she was among the 100 highly cited researchers in space science in the year 2017 to 2020. One of the only nine women in the list. She is currently the spokesperson for eRosita and the chair of the Rosita uh, follow up working group. And as I say today, she will talk to us about arctic galactic nuclei as seen from seven X-ray eyes of uh, E. Rosita. So Mara, thank you very much for accepting this invitation and welcome for the first uh, colloquia seminar of IAEA of the year. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rene, very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, kind invitation and the introduction and uh, thank you to give me the possibility to uh, speak to you about uh, AGNs and how Erosita uh, is going to, um, to help uh, our study, but it is more an excuse at this point to speak about uh, Erosita, as you will see. Uh, I will start the talk uh, reminding uh, to all of us uh, why we bother to study uh, AGNs, why we are looking for them. I will then introduce uh, uh, some technical characteristic of erosita and some highlight, and uh, also then I will conclude with how erosita already started to um, help in answering uh, our questions. Um, AGNs are just interesting or uh, are actually important. Uh, they are definitely uh, interesting because in a galaxy uh, in the center, you have uh, that uh, in the, a region that has the size of a solar system, uh, you have uh, a point that is uh, uh, several hundred times brighter than the entire galaxy. And this uh, supermassive black hole that is active is manifesting its uh, uh, presence in many uh, in many different ways at every uh, wavelength. You have uh, accretion disk, you have a uh, broad line uh, uh, emission, you have the variability uh, in many wavelengths, you have the presence of jets, you have the dust uh, heated up. So as uh, from the phenomenological, phenomenological point of view, uh, studying AGN is really uh, interesting. However, the situation changed dramatically in 98 when uh, the paper of Magorian and the uh, NUCA team came out and uh, they, um, what was found is that 
in a, a normal massive passive galaxy, so elliptical objects, not only there was a supermassive black hole in the center, but also there was a correlation between the black hole mass and the physical parameter of the galaxies in this particular plot, the stellar mass. So from being an interesting and peculiar object to study by themselves from few astronomers, he became a key ingredient in galaxy evolution because every galaxy uh, is, was, will be uh, an EGN and maybe it is even a recursive event. Uh, we have uh, um, since then learned a lot uh, we have uh, here another plot similar to uh, the one before, just uh, 10 years old, but it's still relevant because uh, it shows uh, the original points uh, of uh, uh, the Magoria Nuker team uh, data uh, with, uh, in, with implemented more data at the lower mass uh, and even uh, now a AGN with black hole mass uh, measure via the reversion mapping. And this time the plot is showing um, velocity dispersion rather than um, host mass, and it's still uh, the relation hold for all these uh, order of magnitude um, uh, perfectly. So there is a way in which uh, these two, uh, the galaxy and uh, the supermassive black hole are connected. There is this interplay already uh, accepted also uh, when you look, for example, at the um, star formation, uh, the cosmic star formation history expressed as a uh, uh, star formation uh, rate density and compared with the black hole uh, growth, of course, after rescaling. And you can see here uh, AGN selected in uh, infrared or in uh, uh, X-ray. And you see that uh, for both galaxies and AGN, the peak uh, of the sources is uh, between Rechi 1 and 2. So you have uh, this uh, interplay, uh, this uh, uh, knowing uh, each other present, but the mechanism in which uh, these uh, uh, two uh, objects interplay, it's still uh, uh, very unclear. All the physics be behind it is, uh, uh, we start now just to understand. And because uh, the AGN phase uh, is uh, longer than uh, our lifetime, the only way to really understand how the AGN phase uh, influence the galaxy evolution is uh, to look at the work from a statistical point of view and have a large census of uh, AGNs. In this uh, plot, you see the number density of objects uh, of AGNs that can be detected using uh, radio, near infrared, optical imaging and spectroscopy, uh, X-ray, uh, soft and hard, and, and gamma. Uh, by the way, this uh, paper is actually uh, very uh, interesting because it is a review of uh, AGN on what we know uh, at any uh, wavelength. So if there are students in the audience, I really suggest uh, to read this paper. Uh, what you learn from this plot in particular is that the uh, X-ray detection is the one that is uh, most efficient. But you have to be careful to not believe that this is uh, uh, that studying uh, AGN selected in X-ray uh, is uh, uh, the best way. Everything is actually complementary. And I hope to convince you about that, just showing you this plot where uh, we show the AGN selected in X-ray, uh, different X-ray depths in the three colors, and AGN selected in uh, optical and infrared data. And you see that uh, despite being the AGN many thousand in one selection, the objects that are in common to all three selections are extremely small. Uh, this cannot be due only to uh, depth of the data. You can think that this is just because the data are shallow. In reality, this is happening also in very deep data, like in the cosmos area with 26 magnitude uh, for uh, every band. And again, you have the same situation. You have AGN selected in optical, in mid-infrared, and in X-ray. Uh, and despite having many thousand objects, only hundreds are uh, common to all uh, the uh, surveys implying that if you really wanted to understand AGNs, you really need to dig them out from every uh, multi-wavelength uh, uh, selection. Of course, today we are going to speak about X-ray selection because I wanted to focus on uh, Erosita uh, highlights. And uh, I just want to remind you that the X-ray selection provides you a clean, a pure selection because it is the less affected by uh, host galaxy emission and dust obscuration. And in principle, it allows you also to reach the uh, very high redshift where everything uh, began. 
And before Erosita, uh, all the things that we have studied in uh, AGNs come from uh, essentially these surveys. Maybe a couple are still missing from this old plot. What you have here is a surveys done in green by Rosat, in blue by XMM, and in magenta by uh, Chandra. And for the non-expert, what you see is that when the data are very deep, the area is very small because this is a technical, um, is due to the te techni technicality of the observation in, uh, in X-ray, you have pencil being survey very deep or you go bright and uh, but you, st you stay shallow, but you cover the entire sky. And what we have learned um, in terms of AGN evolution using this data can be expressed via a luminosity function. It is uh, uh, by taking all the your AGN and uh, splitting them as a function of the day luminosity and in redshift bin, essentially you count them and you see uh, if you are able to create a model that explain how the change is done going from the local universe to the high redshift. And if I focus in any of these bin, just pick up uh, the small one here, uh, what you see is that in particular in uh, the high redshift and uh, um, high luminosity, the points are so small uh, or so few and the error bar so large that there is uh, no way to distinguish between uh, two possible models of evolution that uh, this particular paper was uh, uh, trying to present. Uh, in this slide, I'm making essentially the same point uh, where uh, again, focusing on the high luminosity and the high redshift, uh, here the models that explain the evolution are different, but again, uh, the data are not of sufficient quality to disentangle, to discriminate between model A versus model B, regardless the models. And again, uh, these are just other examples of the same point. What is also interesting is that uh, uh, until Rosita, the data coming from the service uh, were the same data, simply treated in a different way. And so we were even reaching different results uh, just because the data were um, treated differently, really uh, underlying the need of a more comprehensive sample of uh, AGNs. And now is uh, how Rosita is coming into place. Uh, just before going to uh, results, let's speak a bit, a bit about the technical part. Uh, you have to remember that uh, Erosita has uh, uh, seven telescopes. Uh, each of the telescopes have 54 uh, mirror shells uh, ingest, in, in nested in uh, each other. The um, half energy width is uh, between 16 or second and 26 or second, depending on whether we are in pointed observations or in a survey mode. The energy range is between 0.2 and 10 keV, and the spectral energy resolution at 6 keV, just to give you a reference, is comparable to the one of XMM. The other point, important point that you wanted to keep in mind is the field of view, which is almost one square degrees, and this is going to make the difference when you want to make a large sky, a large survey area. Uh, the mission started, the, the, so the, the rocket has been launched in uh, July uh, 2019, and the survey mode started in uh, December 2019. Uh, the plan was uh, to have uh, four years of observations, and because of the way in which Erosita is taking the data, it takes six months to cover the entire sky, so we are going to have eight all-sky survey of uh, comparable depth, but then, of course, uh, you have uh, that uh, when you combine the data, you get uh, deeper and, and deeper, reaching up to 25,000 times deeper than what Rosat was uh, 20 years ago. After the four years of observations in uh, survey mode, we are going to offer a pointed observation so that you also have the chance to look at your favorite place in the sky. Uh, people involved in this uh, enterprise are uh, listed here. We have Andrea Merloni, which is the PI of the mission uh, after Peter Perdel um, um, retired. And you have uh, that uh, um, most of the contribution come from uh, DLR funding. There are some associated uh, institutes, and these are the ind industries that were involved. But what I would like really to underline in this slide is that essentially, the core of the work has been done all at MP at my institute. We started from the, uh, it is the scientific lead institute. We took care of the project management and instrument design, manufacturing, integration. We are those that are handling the data 
processing them, archiving them, and so on. So I think that is really a huge effort in the end of uh, uh, just one, uh, one institute, although some other people from our other institute are uh, contributing. Here you see uh, Irosita uh, completely mounted on the rocket just before lunch, together with RTXC, that is the other uh, hard X-ray um, instrument from the Russian side that is traveling with Irosita. And RTXC has been recently renamed in uh, honor of the PI Nikolai Pavlisky that uh, uh, died last year. More on the technical part, you see here why the alpha energy width is different depending on whether you are in pointed observation, so that the PSF is well-defined, very uh, circular, while if you are in survey mode, you have to use some of the data that are affected by uh, aberration, and so the PSF then degraded it, and this uh, will have some consequences in the way in which you detect the counterparts, but I will go back later to that, uh, to that point. If you look at the effective area and you compare it with uh, other instruments like ROSET, XMM, and Chandra, uh, you see how the Erosita uh, 7 mirrors are comparable to uh, XMM at 1 kV, but because of the large field of view, then our survey speed is a factor of five, six times better. Another important point from the scientific point of view is the homogeneity of, of the uniformity of the detector. You see it is absolutely flat. And this is going to be essential when you want to do um, selection function where you really need to have a complete control of, uh, of the background. So having a, a uniform detector is definitely uh, very important. Um, just, to, just to have an idea how big the field of view is, here you have the Moon as reference, the XMM, uh, XMM uh, Chandra, and finally Rosita. And when we look at large areas, areas in the sky, uh, this is uh, what allows us to have this kind of uh, image. Now, I do not know if you are impressed by this picture. I personally, I am uh, all the time I look at it because uh, for a moment you can forget that you are looking at the X-ray data. It looks like you are looking maybe at some globular cluster in the optical. And this is just not a galaxy. This is just a plasma uh, that is uh, coming between a thousand of galaxies. That for me, this uh, is uh, fascinating. Putting uh, our uh, Erosita in the context, uh, um, as I was showing before, these are the surveys that were known. And as you can see from this plot, you see how this area was completely um, un uncovered before. And so Erosita is really opening a new parameter space. Here you have uh, uh, Eras 1, the first old sky survey, which was already in the old sky eight times, uh, eight times and a half deeper than what. Uh, um, Rosat was, uh, and then uh, later how it will be at the era eight, and we are filling up continuously this uh, area. This plot is uh, shown for the point-like sources, while this is uh, for the extended point sources. And one thing that I would like to highlight is that not only we are going to have uh, this uh, uh, depth uh, for the old sky and the pole at the end of the survey, we are also going to have for the first time an old sky. Uh, in the hard X-ray sample, which is uh, uh, at the moment completely missing. So we are really going to uh, uncover new, uh, new things there. Despite me, I wanted to speak about Erosita and how it is helping uh, AGN-related science, I wanted to underline that the main science driver is uh, for Erosita cosmology and large-scale large structure. You wanted to detect the clusters uh, as I read it as possible. The way of identifying clusters is uh, from the uh, hot plasmas that uh, um, they are, um, in which they are indeed. And so having an X-ray detector is the best way to uh, detect them. And we are expecting with the Rosita to detect at least uh, 10 to five clusters more massive than 10 to 14 uh, solar masses, depending on which kind of uh, simulations you are uh, adopting. And the simple um, way to think in how um, Erosita is going to help, uh, this is just the order zero of uh, uh, discovery space, is uh, to uh, understand which of the various cosmological models that are available at the moment 
are actually the more correct to be considered. Uh, here, what I'm showing is uh, how uh, all uh, four uh, models in, uh, in this figure are able to represent uh, the uh, large scale structure at the local universe, but they arrive to this final stage uh, coming from a completely different distribution of matter in space. And so being able with Erosita to reach object a redshift higher than one is going to help us to understand which of this mo um, model, or maybe none of them, are really going to be uh, the right one to, to consider. Uh, in reality, uh, Erosita uh, will help uh, um, cluster cosmology, cluster astrophysics in uh, many other ways. These are just a few of the questions that uh, we can think of. Some of the questions have already some answer in the paper that you have seen here. I don't know if you uh, noticed that this was happening at the end of June uh, during the uh, AS 2021. Um, we had uh, um, the first data release and the first bunch of uh, 40 plus uh, uh, papers come, uh, come in there. If you look at our webpage, uh, all the papers are listed there. Uh, and if you wanted to have a talk uh, exclusively dedicated to science related to clusters and cosmology, please contact uh, Ezra Bulbur, who is uh, the chair of the uh, cluster working group uh, at, uh, in Erosita. Just to give you um, a discovery space from Erosita, here you have uh, the first uh, supercluster that we have detected. It is the highest redshift uh, so far, 0 0.36. And you see the comparison between the uh, X-ray sources and the uh, density map from Hyper Supreme Cam. And you can see the match one to one. And we are expecting to have 450 of these uh, objects. Um, at the end of the survey. Uh, more highlighted about uh, um, Erosita, uh, you have uh, in terms of old sky, uh, this is uh, what we knew the, the X-ray uh, sky being uh, at the time of Rosette, and this is uh, with uh, um, ERAS-1, the first six months. You can really see uh, how the, the difference are uh, coming up. In blue, you have the part that is uh, absorbed by uh, our uh, Milky Way, and uh, uh, all the dots here are uh, stars and uh, um, AGN. And what is amazing to see is that you can already uh, identify uh, by eyes the presence of uh, uh, superclusters, uh, known uh, supernova remnant, uh, known uh, cluster, and so on. So just looking at this image uh, for me is amazing. It's also beautiful uh, to notice that if you remove uh, all the, um, the point sources and uh, uh, you smooth the image, uh, what come out uh, is uh, not only the presence of this bubble, the northern part uh, that was uh, uh, already known, uh, you also uh, discover for the first part, uh, for the first time, uh, the uh, bubble on the uh, southern part. And what is amazing is to see uh, these are perfectly uh, concentric to the Fermi bubbles that are associated, that are thought to be associated to um, activity in the past from our supermassive black hole in the Milky Way. So this is, can be really, um, and is, is a nice confirmation of uh, uh, that event. You can see more uh, about it in the paper of Peter Predel, uh, Natural 2020. Uh, from the uh, galactic studies point of view, here I'm just showing some examples. You have uh, uh, X-ray dust scattering. Uh, you see an image uh, when the, the, the disk was found uh, six months later, when it was almost dissolved. Um, what is nice to see in this picture is also see in six months how the X-ray sky has changed. So you can easily go and see uh, these objects uh, was uh, uh, not there. Uh, so if you come, if you slowly look at it, there are at least uh, uh, 10 events uh, uh, difference between uh, this image and this image. Already telling you, I will mention it later, that the transient sky in X-ray uh, is also going to be one of the major discovery space for uh, Erosita. Um, we have a beautiful uh, um, supernova remnant, as I was saying, in this uh, paper, uh, Martin Meyer was uh, discussing the uh, chemical evolution of the uh, Pupis A 
uh, supernova. And it is amazing to see that this just guy, this guy is just the small uh, supernova remnant on the foreground of the Vela supernova. And in the same image, uh, you see also another uh, supernova uh, remnant, the, the, the Vela Junior with the um, neutron star in the, in the middle. And all these kind of observations, again, are possible because of the large field of view of Hirosita and the homogeneity of the background. Uh, recently, you probably have seen also that we have found this uh, uh, gigantic four degrees in, sky, in size for the largest supernova remnant ever discovered in, in X-ray. From the spectroscopical properties of the objects, let me show you in this uh, uh, plot the, um, the spectra of the supernova uh, 87A compared uh, with the comparison between uh, Erosita and uh, XMM. And what is important to notice is how well the emission lines are uh, well identified. Erosita also suffer less of redistribution of photons at the low energy, and so our uh, spectra is a little bit different than the one of XMM. And teams uh, from both sides are actually uh, helping each other out for uh, improving the calibration. Let's now go back to AGN. Um, and uh, what we have done here, these are data, uh, I would like to remind you, these are uh, uh, public data now. Uh, what we have done is uh, instead of waiting for uh, four years to get uh, a, a preview of the entire sky, we have selected an area of 140 square degrees um, that uh, we observed at the depth of the final uh, ERAS-8. Uh, so here you have the where if it's um, in terms of depth and area is, so that we could on one side test all our machinery and also on the other side try to uh, do um, some um, pre um, prediction on what we will be defined in, uh, in ERAS-8. So here again, uh, the image, how it appears, and uh, in black and white, you have just uh, uh, an example here, again, on the homogeneous background and the presence of the clusters and the point sources in, the, in addition. Uh, we have already, um, just in this uh, area, just to give you some numbers, uh, we have uh, um, 440 optically confirmed cluster. In total, they are 540. We have uh, um, 28,000 uh, point sources, and 85% are actually AGN. We have information on the variability, on the X-ray spectra, and from the uh, in terms of uh, uh, all sky survey, we have instead 1.1 million objects. Uh, that is twice the number of objects known in, uh, in terms of point sources before uh, Erosita was uh, was launched. We have already identified 80 percent of all the blaza, and we are just waiting for uh, uh, the spectroscopy coming from Foremost and Sloan Five. Um, I was telling before that uh, Erosita is uh, um, filling up the gap here. You have an example or uh, a demonstration here. What you see here are all the AGNs that we have detected in uh, Chandra Cosmos and in Rosat. And in the middle here, you have the IFEDS uh, uh, sources. They are split in two colors for the stellar component and for the AGN, and this line is actually the one, one of the lines that we are using for disentangling the nature of, uh, of our objects. In uh, uh, total, we are expecting to have 3 million AGN, and uh, the distribution expected is here in orange compared with the uh, AGNs that are coming from uh, these various uh, pencil beam uh, surveys. And essentially, with these 3 million objects, you are going to do uh, incredible things because the, you have the possibility to stack the spectra of objects um, split in properties from the host galaxy or the AGN itself in uh, luminosity, in mass uh, variability. So we are going to have a really X-ray ACDs for different type of objects. And what we think is that Erosita will be for AGN studies what Sloan has been for galaxy evolution. One thing that was always a little bit uh, puzzling uh, was uh, uh, the fact that we claim that X-ray allows you to go 
uh, a high redshift, but uh, uh, the expert in the room knows that so far we were never able to go uh, beyond redshift 5.3, I believe, and all what we know of uh, uh, X-ray properties of uh, objects at redshift higher than five comes from dedicated follow-up of uh, optically selected quasars. And uh, this was really puzzling. And uh, again, uh, the mystery is solved uh, when you think that you need a large area survey in order to identify these uh, rare objects. Here you can see already the first two objects that uh, are uh, published uh, last year, uh, Redshift 6, uh, Redshift 5.5. And already using uh, these two data, uh, we are uh, uh, kind of claiming here that the luminosity function, as it was predicted in reality, was a little bit too steep, and in reality, the uh, distribution is going to be um, way, uh, way smoother. Uh, this slide is from six months ago. In reality, we have already now uh, at least 10 um, objects uh, at redshift higher than 5.5. These are the objects with the square circle around. Um, the highest redshift that we have is a 6.8 something, I believe. And so we are uh, um, having uh, papers in preparation uh, about uh, the evolution of the luminosity function uh, because of finally we are getting the object at high redshift. From the models that try to uh, combine galaxy evolution and quasars, we know that there is a phase of uh, uh, obscure AGNs where there is a, a wind going on um, merging going on uh, and uh, uh, strong uh, activity in the uh, accretion disk, but everything is obscured by the dust. And we know that this phase is also extremely uh, short, and that's why it is very rare uh, to be found. And this is just an example of uh, uh, this particular uh, phase in the paper of uh, Marcella Brusa, where we have uh, this uh, typical uh, quasar 2 type objects, where from the X ray, so quasar. Uh, objects where from the X-ray spectra, you can clearly see that is a, a type two quasar. From the optical spectra, you can clearly see the uh, outflow indicated by the broadening of the uh, oxygen line. And from the optical image, you can see that probably is emerging in place. And we are expecting to find another 500 of those by the end of the survey. So these are all the ingredients that will help us with time in a better understanding how we uh, AGN role uh, affect the galaxy evolution. One word now on what is more my work, and I, I will start uh, reminding you that uh, when you uh, do uh, an SD fitting, you are, we do not have uh, an instrument that cover the UV from UV to radio, but you always need to have a kind of uh, mechanism that connect the SEDs. And so you need to be extremely sure that you are uh, taking uh, the, um, the same object when you are building the SED. And this is easy to be done when you are um, working in optical, where it is easy to go from an object to another. It is more difficult when you wanted to go in uh, from optical to wise, for example, or as in particular case from optical to uh, X-ray. So what I try to highlight here is why on the X-ray point of view, you have uh, these uh, three blobs indicating a point source. Uh, uh, we know in this case, the object is a nearby uh, object. It is here, you have the object at uh, 0.6, the quasar two, and we have an object at 5.82. Um, because the X-ray emission can be uh, generated by also uh, stars or, or far away clusters or the AGN, uh, to find the right counterpart can be extremely um, challenging. And uh, because uh, you are not searching within uh, open one R second or one R second, but within uh, an area that is depending on the positional error of the uh, X-ray uh, survey, uh, then uh, the, the association can become extremely challenging. Just to give you an idea again for the non-expert, uh, positional error is uh, of uh, sub R second for most of the objects in Chandra to a handful of uh, R second for XMM. For Rosette, it was reaching up to 50 or 60 or seconds. And here you have uh, Erosita, where you have that majority of the objects are at five or second, but you can reach 
uh, also reach a 15 hour second also. So the challenge for us is to identify the right source within all the sources that are here within say 30 hour second. And this is the part of the work that I am doing. Uh, one of the problems that we have when we are finding the right counterpart is that depending on the catalogs that you are using for the association, uh, you are going to have uh, different results. If we were uh, live, I would have asked you uh, to tell me uh, in this real case, uh, whether the object that we have identified as counterpart is this one in zeta band, this one in the K band, or any of them in the B band. In the B band, there is actually one object that is really in the middle of, at the, at the, at the position of the X ray um, coordinates, where the circle is the area search for finding the right counterpart. The right counterpart is this one in the K band, and we know that because for this particular case, we also have Chandra. But the point that I wanted to make here is that when we use only one band and we try to uh, take into account when we assign the probability of the object to be the right counterpart, we normally take into account the separation between the X resource and the optical one. We take into account the positional error between the uh, for the two surveys, and we also take into account the number source, num the source number density in each catalog. We are not taking into account the fact that this catalog is missing these objects and these objects. So we are always not uh, uh, correct in our estimate of uh, probability of chance association. The right way to do the work is go Bayesian. Because with the Bayesian method, you can work simultaneously with many catalogs and also account for the uh, probability that an object is present in one catalog and not in another. So I'm not going to explain in detail these slides. I'll just leave it for you later to look at it, but essentially explain how the probability are assigned to try to understand for each of the X-ray sources how the possible, all the possible combination of uh, images uh, um, are uh, uh, are then providing you a probability. The other plus of working with uh, Bayesian is the fact that you can separate the probability of finding the right counterpart in two parts. One that is coming from the spatial information, which is the one that we just discussed in the slide, uh, in the previous slides, and one part that can be used as a prior using all what we have learned so far uh, in the properties that the X-ray emitters have. What I mean is that if I use all these three uh, surveys together, I can use the fact that the right counterpart here is present here and not here and not here. It has a different SEDs that these objects here that are in the field or these uh, uh, sources here. So using all what we have learned in XMM and Chandra, uh, we can also better tune our, uh, our um, counterparts uh, the identification. The first example of this work was done when we applied uh, N-Way, uh, which is the, the code that I am advertising. Uh, we use it for identifying the uh, ROSET and XMMSU2 uh, counterparts. And what we have done was using a sample of uh, about 3,000 um, AGN, no, sorry, 3,000 X-ray emitters from 3XMM cut at the depth of Rosat and realizing that in this parameter space, uh, the uh, sources, that is are the dark gray, uh, have a location that is completely different from the bulk of the distribution of the objects uh, in the all-wise uh, uh, field. Uh, remember that every pixel here indicate a uh, uh, number of uh, objects. So you have uh, uh, here in every pixel, you have uh, more than 1,000 objects. So this prior was definitely fundamental for uh, identifying the right counterparts for uh, Rosat. And comparing the source in common between XMM and uh, Rosat, remember, we are speaking about the positional error of 10 seconds against uh, one arc minutes. For the sources in common, um, the counterparts were the same for uh, uh, almost 99% of the cases, indicating really that the method works. For uh, IFEDs or Erosita in general, what we are approaching is something a little bit more complicated. In this case, we were looking by hand for uh, a parameter space that was allow allowing us to disentangle 
the right uh, com counterpart from the field population. Here we are uh, um, asking uh, machine learning, in particular random forest, to identify uh, which are uh, the features that uh, um, we wanted to consider one, when uh, we wanted to disentangle the right counterparts from the field population. So we have used a sample of uh, 23,000 uh, XMM sources, and we have learned that uh, using uh, the flux correct for extinction, using the, uh, together with the Gaia photometry, the signal to noise ratio, proper motion, parallax, and this color all at the same time, we have a success rate uh, uh, of uh, about 96% in completeness and uh, purity. And these numbers are coming from uh, a sample of 3,500 uh, Chandra sources with the absolutely well-known uh, counterparts. And then we uh, made uh, the positional accuracy erosita-like and tried uh, to get the right counterparts. And so for me, having uh, 96 or more percent of purity and completeness um, was a really, uh, really a success. So I'm really happy about the, the result. I'm, I'm confident of the counterparts that we are proposing. Going back to uh, Erosita and what uh, um, Erosita can do for AGN, I would like to remind us about the, um, the fact that because Erosita is continuously looking at the sky, uh, we are sensible to um, sensitive to um, a transient event. Uh, we are here, you have uh, the entire sky and it is color coded as, uh, as a function of the number of visits uh, that the uh, point will have uh, over the four years. Here, uh, I, was, uh, I should have started earlier. We have just uh, uh, an example of how, these are real data, by the way, how Erosita uh, is mapping uh, the entire sky in the South Ecliptic Pole. And uh, uh, you see really at the every uh, pass sources popping up, it can go faster a bit and you can start to see here uh, the Magellanic clouds. And here, as you see, this is the, our deepest area of about under, no, 10 square degrees, uh, the deepest, and this is the, the, the area here. If you uh, translate uh, uh, the transient events that are known uh, in uh, X-ray. Here you have uh, the uh, distribution in a luminosity function, um, uh, uh, time, um, variability scale, and the distance. And here you have uh, the cadence of our observation. And depending on uh, the cadence that you are considering and luminosity and variability and distance, you see how Erosita is going to be uh, efficient in study different type of uh, objects in our galaxy and also uh, extragalactic. I would like now to give you a few examples uh, of this. Uh, we have, uh, uh, because of this ability of uh, uh, revisiting the area, we have the ability not to follow up uh, the entire AGN phase of an AGN, but we have the possibility to see when an AGN is turning on or uh, turning off, for example. So there are uh, studies that are um, currently uh, underway to discuss a few uh, interesting cases that came up uh, just um, recently. Uh, again, on the SEP, uh, just give you an idea of the light curves that we are available to we are able to produce uh, not only for quasars and, and ciphers, but also for uh, uh, galactic sources. And of course, now the, um, what the task is uh, to understand what is uh, uh, generating these uh, uh, light, uh, light curves. And again, the work is in progress with uh, the work of David Bogesberger, uh, which is one of our PhD students. Um, another uh, interesting um, event are the uh, TDE, Tidal Disruptions uh, event. This was uh, an object that was found uh, last uh, summer, I believe. And uh, it is an interesting object because it, be it behaves uh, in the, from the X-ray point of view like a Tidal Disruption event, but the light curves are um, in the optical bands is something uh, completely different. And, uh, uh, there are further studies um, in progress for trying, trying to understand uh, what these objects really are. And what we believe is that really uh, the addition of 
the Rosita data to all the transient study is going to make us uh, to discover really new type of populations. An example of this is uh, um, the discovery of uh, uh, quasi-periodic uh, uh, eruptions. In 2019, I believe, a paper came out uh, uh, from Mariuti et al, uh, where two objects of that type were uh, found. And our student at that time, Ricardo Arcodia, uh, went to uh, our data and found the other two objects previously uh, not known. And uh, you can see here, uh, the, um, if you consider this is the background, uh, here is uh, how the uh, X-reflux uh, is, uh, um, is going up and down for uh, uh, the objects, and here you have uh, um, the, um, the spectra uh, analysis of the same objects in two different states, so there's the, the low and the, and the high state. Uh, observing the object with uh, NICER has shown a beautiful uh, up and down of, uh, I believe it was uh, um, less than a day um, a time, so really an interesting object. And what the optical data have shown is that while the other two objects were known, uh, were hosted in uh, AGN, so broad line uh, objects, uh, these two objects both are in uh, narrow line objects, again indicating that there is much more to discover because we have four objects, two are on the broad line component, two are a narrow line AGN, so we really need to understand what is uh, uh, generating these uh, um, eruptions and how they can be explained. And again, there are more papers that are in, uh, in preparation. And with that, uh, I believe my talk is uh, uh, over. I was probably a bit too uh, far, no, 45, nothing is good. Uh, so just let me uh, summarize uh, um, the, um, what I was uh, mentioning. Uh, Irosita is uh, uh, working fine. We just finished the fourth of the eight uh, OSK surveys that were uh, uh, planned. And uh, uh, we are getting more than uh, um, we are from the data that we have in hand now. We can already say that uh, we are detecting more than the 3 million AGNs and more than 10 to 5 uh, clusters that we were uh, expecting. Uh, and in addition to the AGNs and the uh, cluster size, Erosita is going to revolutionize, if you like, uh, many, many other aspects of uh, uh, astronomy because we are. Uh, continuously discovering uh, new, new things. Uh, we have uh, released uh, uh, the first uh, data um, in June, as I said, last year. The next uh, All Sky Survey uh, data are going to be released by the end of this year, so 2022. So in one year from now, you are going to be able to play with all the uh, ERAS-1 data. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mara, for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, now the talk is open for questions. For all participants, please raise your hand, pressing the button uh, reactions in the, in the bottom of your screen. And for the questions, uh, Anchon and Verdi will manage all the questions. So Anchon, are you there? Hello. Hello, how are you? Thanks a lot, for Mara, for this very nice talk. Really, it's a, a great starting talk for our seminar program for this year. Thanks a lot. Thank really, you. I am impressed by the variety of results that you have already got with Erosita, and I am sure there will be a lot of questions. Okay, then uh, time for questions is open. Uh, any of you that want to make a question, please uh, raise your hand here in the Zoom. Okay, uh, since I, I will start, I have a lot of curiosities. Uh, I will start and I'm sure that there will be more questions later. The, the first one is referring to one of the last results you have already shown, referring to the, the uh, variability that you have determined for, for many objects in particular. I, I, I would like to answer which is the shortest time scale of variability you have been able to determine in any of these kind of objects. Uh, good question. So I think that I have to relate to this question, to this plot. It really okay. depends on uh, uh, where you are looking, because uh, the, uh, while at the SEP 
uh, the overlap is practically constant. Uh, if you go to the equator, then the overlap is really almost uh, every six months. So you're really having uh, little. On the um, shortest um, time scale, um, I I, I I'm not able to answer uh, right now. I only can only say that uh, studying uh, the SEP is allowing us to realize that a lot of sources that are believed to be variable actually are not, it is just noise. And so they, a lot of the time that has been sent, uh, spent in identifying variable objects in the SEP is actually in uh, disentangling what is a uh, true variable and what is not. Uh, I can ask the um, David um, exactly what is the shortest, and I can mm -hmm. come back to you, but the number is actually now, I do not know. But again, the problem is not really uh, detecting the shortest, to understand whether that detection is real or not. Okay, yeah, I understand that. Okay, thanks a lot. Pepa Maserosa, please, I give you the floor. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Mara. Hi. See you here in our institute, uh, in, even if it's virtually. I yes. hope uh, to bring you here uh, soon after after this. Uh, Looking situation. forward. <laughs> and yeah, I have, uh, as you can imagine, many, 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 many questions and curiosities. But uh, I will I would, uh, concentrate in one of the uh, last work we are start doing and this is about the changing low object um so uh, do you cover the same region that uh, in the optical by the sweet sweet telescope uh, good point. So what we do normally is uh, we first detect uh, the objects in Erosita and then we uh, immediately, we have a program approved in Swift so that we can immediately go back uh, and uh, look at uh, X-ray data from Swift and also look at the optical part and XMM as well. So we do not have, um, so, so we have an optical uh, part observed at the same time of SWIFT and XMM. And in addition, what we do, we have uh, an instrument that is called GROND that is uh, on uh, La Silla. And if we have uh, particularly interesting objects, then we'll go and look with GROND, which is a, a seven band uh, optical camera, uh, GRI, Z, uh, J, H, and K. And so we can uh, do the follow up also in the, in the optical. Yes, and, and do you have also follow? I suppose because uh, with the, uh, I mean, with the with the uh, the good efficiency of the of Erosita, uh, I suppose is allowed to compare with XMM and and no. the time is of course for for the common short is yeah, the time last correct. we have yeah. is, is really good to 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 find if uh, the warm absorber. Uh, it changing or not? Yeah, that is one of the main yeah, discussions so, yeah, so, in changing look. So I think what we are doing is, uh, as I was saying before, we have uh, the detection in Erosita, but then the follow up is done with better instruments like XMM and uh, and Swift. Just because uh, Erosita goal is really to identify the source uh, sources, but then the follow up need to be done with something more uh, dedicated. You want to have a better quality, better resolution, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And of uh -huh. course, uh -huh. hope to see to to see, see you here in the institute. Thank you. We'll do. Thanks a lot, Pepa. Francisco Carrera, now, please go ahead. Hi, Francisco. Hey, Mara. Hi. <laughs> nice talk. I'm very impressed by your very excellent work and the people. Well, all over the place, especially at MP. Uh, well, again, plenty of things com to comment about, but, you know, going to one of my favorite topics about the cross matching. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I've, I've seen, you know, this, this paper is, is very impressive, but I, I guess you, you I, I may have missed it, but you probably have plans to do proper spectroscopic uh, identifications of the X-ray sources, right? Yes. So we have uh, the 
um, I probably I didn't mention, actually, I'm sure I did not mention. Um, Erosita uh, collaboration has, uh, is a major player in, or say one of the player for Sloan 5 and for Foremost. And we are going to get the spectroscopic follow up uh, for all the objects that we uh, have detected within uh, ERAS 3. So already starting this year, we are going to have uh, uh, more spectroscopy available and uh, those data become uh, available uh, then do, following the uh, Sloan uh, um, re data releases. In particular, the first data release, I think this is uh, interesting for everyone, for the 140 square degrees of effects, uh, we are releasing already this year all uh, the redshifts uh, for uh, uh, the entire uh, sample uh, stellar AGNs and clusters, that means just for the um, AGN part, I believe we have of the order of uh, uh, 15,000 spectra or 14,000 spectra. And so essentially two thirds of all the AGNs in EFEDs are going to be uh, spectroscopically confirmed. For the other, we also have a photosis, but already from the spectra, you can also see that these are indeed the AGNs because the spectra are speaking clearly, meaning also that we got the right uh, counterparts there. So you have either M stars or uh, AGNs essentially. Can I make another question? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So uh, have you been able to detect any, to identify any sources just because of the iron emission line in X-rays? Uh, uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I think that the, the problem that we have uh, with the data yet is that uh, the uh, resolution of the spectra for the uh, AGN is still not uh, enough uh, because uh, we, we were still looking at the, um, yeah, the, the data are not uh, deep enough. Uh, and precise enough for making this kind of analysis. It is expected to be done for a few thousand of them, but at the moment that part of the analysis is not done. But of course, uh, having the uh, iron feature uh, will allow you to give you a precise redshift, uh, but then you still do not know which is the right counterpart, right? You still have to know <laughs> which is <laughs> the right one. So that sense make, them make more sense to go to look at the counterparts and then see whether the redshift is the same that you get from the iron part. What we are doing now in general is uh, uh, starting from the counterparts uh, using either the spectroscopic or the photometric redshift and then do the spectral analysis of the x ray one, of the x ray spectra, but assuming that we know the information from the, from the other side. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Francisco. Any other question from any of the attendants to the seminar? Okay, I have another one, if you don't mind. <laughs> if, Please. Yes, uh, referring to these results on the EFETS survey you, you were showing, you mentioned that you 80% uh, of the blazers known, okay, have been detected. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there anything special about the other 20%? Why are they not? Ah. Why haven't they been detected? Um, it's a good question. I think uh, uh, I, could, I could say variability could be one issue. Uh -huh. um, I can also uh, say that uh, the team, uh, so first of all, this slide is, the, I, I will need to check whether the numbers are still the case, um, are, are still there. Um, there is a one uh, issue is that uh, at the moment, uh, uh, Erosita coverage of, from the multi weapon point of view, is not uh -huh. completed. Yeah. We have uh, the majority of the sky covered by um, the legacy survey DR9 or uh, by Catwise 2020. So Catwise 2020 is the one that covered the entire Erosita the A sky. And uh, uh, we are using both independently in order to find the right counterparts. And so some of the objects uh, do not have the right counterparts because of, in order to find, sorry, the many of the blazers are not identified because uh, simply we do not know yet which is the right counterpart okay. because uh, the multi wavelengths are incomplete. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the point here uh, on the blazer is on the old sky, not on the effects. 
And uh, what I can say in NICE, and that is actually I'm very happy about, I'm happy to, to tell you, um, we uh, have international collaborators, uh, um, Alfredo Zenteno in particular, that uh, run a program on the uh, DECAL uh, telescope for uh, obtaining uh, GRI and Z data band uh, in, that complemented with uh, the DES data and all the decal data that are already existing allowed us to make a complete coverage in uh -huh. GRI and Z for the entire Rosita Day Sky at the depth of DES. And we are in collaboration with the DAISY Imaging Legacy Survey people to uh, reduce the data exactly in the same way of the Legacy Survey DR9 this is going to be the legacy survey year 10 that I hope is going to be public in a couple of months top. So I've seen already the, the images and they are just beautiful. We are working on the catalog now. So what is nice to say is that uh, in less than two months, uh, we are going to have uh, sufficiently deep data in all the bands in order to identify all the counterparts of the Erosita data. Wow. Thanks a lot. Okay, Thanks Peppa. for the question. Uh, Peppa, and do you have another question? Is that correct? Yes, I have. Uh, well, this is not a question. It's a curiosity uh, because we heard that the that the sky coverage were were divided by the Russian part and the European part. Is it still like this? Or? I knew. I knew that speaking about for this, with this question will come. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I was speaking over you, so I didn't hear your question. Can you repeat it? No, the the, the sky coverage, because uh, we heard that uh, the Russian part half half of the sky and the and the and the European part half the other the mm -hmm. other half. It, I don't know if it's still like this yeah. or or you get still, some kind of agreement. It is still uh, like that. The, 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 the sky is split in two, and uh, uh, for agreement with our um, space agency, we agreed to release uh, our data um, as soon as we can after a reasonable amount of time, so data reduction, making sure that everything is fine. So it is our commitment to release our data. On the Russian side, uh, this is not mandatory, so they will have their own uh, time scale for the data releases. I'm speaking only for the Erosita Day. Thank you. Thanks to you for the question. Okay, Mara. Yeah, I don't know whether there is another question. It doesn't look like, let me mention also beautiful results you have shown today as the, this Fermi bubble trace by X-rays. It's, it's really fantastic. Yes, Absolutely. It, if you make the comparison with yes, with the images in radio, for example, is that there is almost a one-to-one -one correlation. It's, it's really fantastic. Yeah, yes, yeah, a curiosity, and I promise is my last my last question. What about the extraction, the extraction, the subtraction of the point sources for for this image in X-rays? How is it? Is it? Uh, I mean, it's because what you do here is you get only the extended emission. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, so here we remove the, these are the point sources subtracted yeah. and smoothed, yes, and then you have uh, it here. Um, this is, uh, you, you're asking me all these dots. Yes. Uh, this is a nice question because they should not be there, so I'm not sure anymore which plot uh, I am uh, using. I should have used actually this one to show you the result. I think that this uh, um, sentence is wrong. It's not the point sources subtracted, they are all there. It's uh -huh. just that the, the background has been uh, corrected. Uh, for exposure, oh. but is uh, the, the, the point sources are there. So sorry, I am wrong there. Okay. Is Very it good. wrong? Wrong. Thank you for pointing that out. I have to correct it. And thanks a lot, Mara. Be be a very beautiful talk. Thanks a lot. And thanks as Peppa has already mentioned, we hope you will be visiting us as soon as possible. As, as soon pleasure. as we get ready of this Omicron, and I hope that there won't be any other. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, any other viruses, but okay, as soon as it is possible to, to travel, please come to visit us. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks a lot again to everybody. Bye. 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 Okay, bye. Thank you.